Now I get a lot of questions on my NHS pension videos, which is great. I love interacting with you all, so please do keep them coming in. However, I have noticed that some of these questions are repeated or they're questions that make me think, oh my God, this should have actually been in my original videos. So I thought it'd be really helpful if I address 15 of those common questions in this one video. So without further ado, I'm Kozan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. Before I get into the video, please do let me know in the comment section down below if you would like me to create any specific content. It can be NHS pension related or it can be completely off the topic. But yeah, let me know down below and yeah, I'll be sure to get back to you. So the first question is, can you opt out of the pension scheme? And the answer is yes, you can opt out any time you like. The pension scheme is a voluntary one, but you are automatically enrolled when you sign up to the NHS. If you do want to leave, there is a particular form that you will need to submit. However, I just want to stress that if you are deciding this, please do seek out professional advice or do a lot of your own research before making such a big decision. The second question is that if you do opt out, will you get your money back? And for most cases, the answer is no. For the majority of us, any money that you do contribute to your pension scheme is effectively locked away, and you can only access this money once you hit either the minimum pension age or the normal pension age. There is a possibility that you can have your pension refunded to you. However, this is only really likely if you have two or less qualifying membership years. Please note that if you are applicable for a refund, your money will be taxed accordingly before it hits your bank account. What if I leave the UK? What happens to my NHS pension then? Now, I know this is a concern for many of you and you'll be delighted to know that you do have some options available to you. The first one being is that if you do have an overseas pension scheme already in place, there is a possibility that you can transfer the NHS pension to that new overseas scheme. The overseas scheme has to be recognized by HMRC as a qualifying recognized overseas pension scheme. The second option that you do have is that once you do reach the appropriate retirement age, you can have the NHS pension paid directly into your overseas bank account. If you are eligible, you will have to fill out an application form and I'll put links to those forms down below as they do differ between countries. So do check that out for more detail. And then the final option that you do have is to set up a UK bank account just for the sole purpose of having the NHS pension pay your final salary into this account. And then you can set up a transfer into your overseas bank account where you can access it. Please be aware that when it comes to overseas transfers, there are typically additional fees and taxes that you will need to consider. So you may need to spend a little bit more time figuring out what is the best way to transfer from point A to point B without paying too much in fees can you reduce your contributions to the NHS pension? The answer to this is no, as contributions are based on your salary. Technically, there is still a way, but that would involve you taking a pay cut and that probably doesn't work very well for you. I know that the rates can seem a bit excessive, particularly with the higher bands. However, please do remember that this is done before tax, so you do get tax relief whenever you contribute to your pension. And I'm gonna give you a very basic example to demonstrate this. Say you earn 100 pounds per month and you decide not to contribute to your pension. That means that entire 100 pounds is subject to income tax. Let's say this is 20%. 20% of 100 pounds is 20 pounds. So your take home pay for that month is going to be 80 pounds. Sticking with the same example, so you are still taking home 100 pounds per month, but this time you contribute 10% to your pension. Now this is done before tax. So 10% of 100 is 10 pounds. So 10 pounds will go to the pension scheme and the remaining 90 pounds will then be subject to tax. And this is still 20% as in the previous example. 20% of 90 pounds is 18 pounds. So your take home pay for that month is 72 pounds. So comparing the two scenarios, you will have noticed that even though you contributed 10 pounds to your pension, you only lost eight pounds in your take home pay. This is due to the tax relief benefits that you do get every time you contribute to your pension. So you need to consider that these numbers are pre-tax contribution rates. In the NHS booklet, they actually do have a section where they show you what the real contribution rates actually are when you consider the tax relief benefits, and they are hovering between four to 8.7%. Where do your contributions and the NHS's 20.68% contributions go to? Now the NHS pension work slightly differently to most other workplace pensions. It is in a unique position in that they are one of the very few sectors that 
provide a defined benefit scheme pension. This is where the scheme gives you a final salary for life until the day you die. And this is very different to most other common workplace pensions, which are known as defined contribution schemes. Under this scheme, your pension is going to be determined by how much you and your employer personally contribute to this pension pot. So that means if you're someone that is contributing loads to your defined contribution scheme, then great, you'll probably have enough money to fund your retirement years until the day you die. And the opposite is also true. If you're not contributing enough, then you may not have enough money to see out your retirement year. So this guarantee that you get with the defined benefit scheme isn't applicable to the contribution scheme. So under the NHS pension scheme, your contributions, let's say it is 9.3%, and your employer's contributions of 20.68% go into this massive NHS piggy bank pension account. So the NHS and everyone that is working for them and is enrolled in the scheme, all their contributions are going into this big NHS pension piggy bank, and this piggy bank is funding all the current NHS retirees with their final salary. So when it comes to you retiring and claiming on that NHS pension, that money will then be funded by the employer and the employees that are enrolled in the scheme at that point in time. So all the money that is being contributed is really just to keep the cogs working in this big piggy bank pension machine. And unlike the defined contribution scheme where the amount of money that you do get is determined by your and your employer's contribution over your working life. Under the NHS pension or the defined benefit scheme, uh, it really depends on which scheme you are in because remember there are three types, but they are typically based on your years of contribution and your salary throughout your working life. So, by the way, if you are enjoying this video, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe with the notification bell on. I release a video every single week talking about all things personal finance with the ultimate aim of helping you be better with your money. So how do you see your current and estimated NHS pension benefits? Unfortunately, because I'm not an NHS employee, I can't actually to give you a live demo on this. However, having researched online, you can find out what your current NHS benefits are, as well as get an estimate of what your benefits could be in the future on something called the Total Rewards Statement Portal. Now to get on to the TRS, you can go onto the gov.uk verify link, or if applicable, you can go on the ESR link as well if your employer has one. Now, when you do finally manage to get in, to find out what your current benefits are should be relatively self-explanatory. However, if you want to get an estimate, there is a getting an estimate on your pension section on this portal. Please also know that there seems to be different varying levels of how an estimate can look like. The more bespoke you want the estimate to be, the more likely a charge will be added to getting this estimate. How can you access your NHS pension once you finally hit the retirement age? How you access your NHS pension really depends on what type of member you are. If you are currently employed by the NHS, you're considered an active member. If you have left the NHS, you're considered as a deferred member. For active members, you do need to actually tell your employer that you intend to retire. And the NHS recommend that you do this at least four months before your intended retirement date. Once you have informed your employer, they will provide you with a retirement benefit claim form known as AW8, which you will need to fill in. Once your application has been processed, you will receive a letter through the post confirming what your pension benefits are and any lump sum amount will be paid to you within 30 days of your retirement date. For those that are deferred members, you will have to go online and download the deferred benefit claim form, also known as 8WHP. I'll put a link in the description box down below also for this form. Once you have filled this out, you just need to post the application form and any supporting documents to their address. And then once your application has been processed, you will again receive a letter through the post confirming what your pension benefits are. What happens to your pension if you pass away before or after your retirement? Either way, in the unfortunate instance where a member of the NHS pension passes away, benefits will be transferred to your spouse or civil partner long-term partner or a nominated partner. To nominate a partner, you do have to fill out a partner nomination form and I'll put a link in the description box down below. Please note that if no partner is nominated, your benefits are automatically transferred to your spouse or civil partner. If you do consider passing on your benefits to any other family member, please do consider inheritance tax as a important factor. Benefits transferred to a spouse or civil partner will not be subject to inheritance tax. 
If it's anyone else, it will be subject to a HMRC review. The amount of benefits that are passed on are based on circumstances at the time of your death, but it is important to note that a lump sum payment can be made out shortly after your death to your beneficiary, and the beneficiary will also be able to claim on a final salary until they pass away as well. A follow up question to that is what if there are children present at the time of your passing? What happens to your pension benefits then? So a children's pension may be payable in the event of your death if you are an active or deferred member. The pension is paid to anyone that is caring for those children or it can be paid to the children directly if they are looking after themselves. So the definition of children really depends on when you joined your scheme. If you have a scheme membership on or after the 1st of April 2008, a dependent child is someone who's dependent on you and is either under 23 years old or age 23 or over, but they are unable to earn a living due to a permanent mental or physical condition. For those that have scheme memberships before the 1st of April 2008, a dependent child again is someone who is dependent on you but they are under the age of 17 or age 17 or over but they are in full-time education or training or regardless of age they are unable to earn a living due to a permanent mental or physical condition. Do you need to nominate your spouse or civil partner as a beneficiary of your pension benefit or is this done automatically? I've already touched this on my previous point, but just to be clear, you do not need to nominate if you want the beneficiary of your pension benefits to be your spouse or civil partner. This will always happen automatically. If you want to nominate anyone else, you do have to fill out a PN1 form. What is the minimum pension age? So as you should be aware, there's something called the normal pension age, which is different to the minimum pension age. Now the normal pension age is when you can start claiming on your pension benefits without any penalty. The minimum is the earliest you can actually start claiming on these benefits, but your pension benefits will reduce as a result of you getting paid out this pension for a longer period of time. So the ages do differ between the schemes. So for those that are under the 1995 section, the normal pension age is 60. For those that are in the 2008 section, this is 65. And for those that are in the 2015 scheme, this is going to be following the state pension age. So it's likely going to be between 66 or 68. Now the minimum pension age for most members is 55. So as I mentioned, you don't have to wait for the normal pension age depending on your scheme. Once you have hit 55, you can, if you want to, start claiming on your pension, but as I mentioned before, your benefits will be reduced as a result of this benefit being paid out to you for a longer period of time. There is one exception to this age, and that was rightly pointed out by someone in the comment section, so thank you for highlighting that to me. So if you have a pension under the 1995 section and you joined prior to the 6th of April 2006, your minimum pension age is actually 50. Do you get your NHS pension alongside your state pension? The answer is yes. Both pensions are completely different and as long as you qualify for both, there is no reason why you can't claim on both. Check out my earlier video on state pensions if you want to find out a little bit more on how much you can get and when you can claim on it. But in just the claim on the amount of state pension that you do receive is dependent on your age and the amount of national insurance contributions you have made in your lifetime. You need to at least have 10 years of national insurance contributions to qualify for state pension. What are my options if I leave the NHS and move to another company? So you actually do have a few options available to you if this happens, but like with anything, there is a lot of variables to consider when it comes to transferring your NHS pension. So please do consider this as somewhat of a high level approach. One thing that I do want to know is that once you have left the NHS, you are no longer eligible to contribute more to your NHS pension. So the first option is that you can simply just leave the benefits within the NHS pension fund and claim it as a deferred member once you hit the appropriate age. This is only applicable for those members that have two or more qualifying years. And if you do decide to use this option, your benefits will increase annually to keep up with the cost of inflation. Option two is that you may be able to transfer your NHS pension benefits to your new pension provider. So if your new pension provider is also running a defined benefit scheme, just like the NHS, although this is very difficult to come across outside of the public sector, and you have two or more qualifying years, you are able to apply for a transfer any time before your normal pension age. If you have less than two qualifying years, then you must transfer within the first 12 months of you joining the new scheme, and this also has to be before your normal pension age. 
Now the third and final option is that you can potentially get a refund on your NHS pension, but this is only a possibility if you have less than two qualifying years. If you have anything more than that, then this is not possible. What happens to your pension if you become terminally ill before you hit retirement? If you do become terminally ill, you can make a claim to your pension benefits immediately, irrespective of whether you reach retirement or not. If the member is 75 years or older, the lump sum that you get when you do become terminally ill will be subject to an extra tax of 55%. You were originally on the 1995-2008 scheme, but you have now transferred to the 2015 scheme. Why has this happened? So when the 2015 scheme was introduced, most members of the 1995 or 2008 schemes were automatically transferred to this new scheme. However, there were a few exceptions. So the first one being is that if members of the 1995 or 2008 scheme at the 1st of April 2012 were either already above their normal pension age or 10 years or less of reaching their normal pension age and are in active memberships of both the 31st of March 2012 and the 31st of March 2015, then you were entitled to something that was called full protection, which meant you would be exempt from transferring over to the 2015 scheme. So the second exception was that members of these legacy schemes on the 1st of April 2012, they are more than 10 years, but no less than 13 years and five months away from their normal pension age and they were active members of both the 31st of March 2012 and the 31st of March 2015, you will be eligible for limited protection, also known as tapered protection. Members with this protection will eventually move on to the 2015 scheme, but this will happen after the 1st of April 2015, which is when this scheme was originally introduced. When these tapered members will move on to the new scheme is really dependent on the age, those that are closest to the 10 year limit will be the last to move over and this will happen on the 1st of February 2022. And the third exception was that those that did not have an active membership in the 1995 or 2008 scheme on both the 31st of March 2012 and the 31st of March 2015, you may still qualify for protection provided that you rejoin the scheme after a break of less than five years. Now this leads me on to my final question, which is what is happening on April 2022? Are all members being transferred to the 2015 scheme? So to cut a long story short, all the things that I mentioned with regards to protection in my last question, the government was actually taken to court for this on the grounds of age discrimination. And the court actually found them guilty of discriminating by age against younger pension scheme members. So this court ruling happened all the way back in 2018. And since then, the government have been coming up with remedies to try and remove this discrimination. And they now have come up with a solution. So this will only be affecting members that have full or tapered protection under the 1995 or 2008 scheme, or members that were automatically transitioned from their legacy scheme to the new 2015 scheme between the dates of the 1st of April 2015 to the 31st of April 2022. And it is this 2015 to 22 time period that the government call the remedy period. So for this remedy period, if you were a member and you were automatically transferred to the 2015 scheme, you will be given an option to compare the benefits on this 2015 scheme versus what it would have been if you were able to stay on your legacy scheme. And then you can choose whichever is the most valuable. The other alternative is of course those that didn't transfer to the 2015 scheme, so they were given full or tapered protection. Again, you will be given the option to compare what the benefits are like under your current scheme versus what it would have been like under the new 2015 scheme. And again, you can choose whatever is the most valuable. So the government have decided that this choice between choosing the new scheme over the older schemes should be deferred rather than being made immediately, which means that you can make this choice once you've hit retirement. So once you are ready to claim on your pension benefits, you should receive a statement comparing the benefits under the 2015 
scheme and the legacy scheme for this remedy period and you can choose whatever is most valuable to you. This also means that from April 2022 there will be no more members under the full protection as the 10 years have now elapsed and those that were under the tapered protection will now have moved over to the 2015 scheme. So that then means that the older legacy schemes 1995 and 2008 will no longer be active and the only active membership will be the 2015 scheme. And I just want to make it very clear here that at any point in this last question when I mention the transferring from the older scheme onto the new scheme, that doesn't mean that the benefits from your older scheme have been transferred to the 2015 scheme. You will still be a member of the legacy scheme, but it just won't be an active membership. So for example, say I was in the 2008 scheme and then I moved over to 2015 scheme. My 2008 scheme didn't merge into the 2015 scheme. I still have the 2008 scheme there. It's just my contributions are no longer being added to that scheme. It's being added to the 2015 scheme. So in theory, I can claim on my 2008 scheme when I hit the normal pension age of 65. And once I hit my state pension age of 68, I can then claim on the 2015 scheme. Cool, so that was a lot to go through and I hope that made things a lot more clearer. Please do let me know in the comment section down below if you do, of course, have any further questions. And as always, if you did find this video really, really useful, I would appreciate if you smash that like button that does wonders for the growth of my YouTube channel. And remember, I release a video every single week. So if you wanna keep up to date with those, hit the subscribe button too. See you later, bye.